I welcome you all to the public engagement meeting uh, death penalty in India legal, ethical and health issues. To say few words about uh, this public engagement meeting as well as its center and uh, Indian Law College. So, Samitra Patra. Hi, good morning everyone. I know we are running late and I'm not going to bore you with a long talk about everything. I uh, welcome all of you to ILS. This is a pleasure to be hosting, co-hosting this uh, uh, particular workshop along with uh, uh, FMES and the ILS Law College. Uh, what we, I hope we have a good day of discussion. This is probably the first time that we managed to get uh, people from health and law background into the same kind of platform uh, to discuss something that is of common interest to us, which is uh, issues around death penalty. Uh, we've got a very packed program and Sandhya is chairing the ses next session and she's already anxious that I should finish on time. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time with Sandhya taking two minutes to tell about the center. The center is a center for mental health law and policy which I direct here which is about 11 years old. Uh, we do uh, work related to mental health policy, mental health law as well as uh, uh, trying out and testing out uh, innovative mental health services. Uh, we are currently working in about uh, three states in India, which is Chhattisgarh, Gujarat and Maharashtra and uh, we are currently also assisting about five to six different countries uh, to get their mental health laws and policies in place, uh, mainly countries in Africa and in the Middle East. Uh, thank you so much and I'm going to hand it over back to Navneet. Uh, so to say a few words about uh, FMES and its activities. So Lumna. Good morning everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Forum for Medical Ethics Society Mumbai. Um, the uh, FMES Bioethics Center has uh, is co-hosting uh, this event. Uh, was established just last year, but uh, the FMES has been around since uh, 1995 now. Um, it's the publisher of the Indian Journal of Medi Medical Ethics uh, and the organizer of the National Bioethics Conferences as well. Uh, we'd like to uh, play a short clip to um, introduce you to our organization and its work. The late 1980s, a period of turmoil amongst the medical profession in India. A group of doctors from Mumbai decide to contest elections to the Medical Council on an ethics platform. They received support from the public and the profession and thus was born Medical Ethics. In 1996, the newsletter became Issues in Medical Ethics and in 2004, a peer-reviewed index journal, the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. In 2005, the journal initiated a biennial National Bioethics Conference. The journal is now the predominant voice on healthcare ethics from South Asia. Its contents are free full text online. It is a model for a journal that has grown without funding or advertisements from the pharma and equipment industry. Over 25 years, it has furthered the cause of integrity and transparency, relentlessly highlighting healthcare ethics at a time when market forces are dominating healthcare. background about why we thought of doing this consultation in the first place. Uh, so I'm going to rush through because we have started a little late. If there are any questions, we have time at the end for it. Okay, often the question that is asked is why death penalty and why now? Maybe we should reverse that question and ask why not death penalty and why not now? So recently, after the Delhi Day takes basically, there has been a lot of outrage about sexual assault. And that has led to a greater coverage of these in the media and consequently a call for stringent action and also endorsements at the highest legislative levels. So what this has really caused is a kind of vicious cycle of more demand for stringent punishment and the legislature and the political class feeling that they need to acquiesce to this demand because that is what people want. For example, if you see uh, there were, of course, as you all know, 
amendments to the protection of uh, uh, ch child protection of children from sexual offences act which actually introduced death penalty for child rape so this was the first time death penalty has been inst instituted for rape which is not uh, resulting immediately into death or a vegetable uh, kind of state so this is a serious uh, development and if you see that 162 pronouncements of death penalty by trial courts took place in 2018 which is much higher than uh, such pronouncements bef before this so now you can see the difference here is that there has been a lot of call for a lot of reforms to take place to improve the both access to healthcare and essential services for survivors of sexual assault and for improving fast tracking of court courts and improving a whole um, their access to the criminal justice system but what we instead see is a lot of those uh, reforms are not being implemented in the right spirit and instead we are going more and more in the direction of retributive uh, justice instead of reparative justice so i just wanted to flag that uh, even uh, retired high court judges eminent people have actually voiced a concern that if rape and murder is going to have the same punishment for example will there be an increased incidence of murder post a rape because the perpetrator may really feel that what is the difference they might as well destroy the evidence so among the many concerns this is one of the concerns the other context of course in which we find that death penalty keeps alive is the context of terrorism a lot of people genuinely feel that crimes like terrorism need to be dealt with the death penalty there was a time when we felt that the death penalty was poised to end for example the bachan singh versus state of punjab judgment has given guidelines for the rarest of rare cases and in the last 14 years there have been only four executions three of them for terrorism one for child rape and that happened in 2004 between 2004 and 2012 there were almost there were no executions so it felt like we are the death penalty is on the way it's on its way out in practice if not in law and probably law would have followed in 2015 the law commission report also said that abolish the death penalty except for terrorism we have other <coughs> constitutional and law experts here to analyze what does that actually mean but for now uh, this was the course till we find that death penalty has made a comeback again in this course in executions and in law because the three executions which we talked about happened between 2012 and 2015 so you can see the difference in the frequency india is among 53 countries which practice uh, capital punishment that's the number of countries is shrinking and shrinking but we are a part of that and we are in company of china indonesia usa iran and saudi arabia and mostly among the developed <coughs> nations it's only the usa which boasts of a death penalty so this brings up important questions of ethics which the forum for medical ethics thought is important for us first to understand the problem and then to generate a constructive debate and we have gone into it in a kind of manner to find out what are the issues around death penalty we did a couple of preparatory uh, meetings and what we found is there are problems one is that death penalty is irreversible so it's important to think about it differently than you think about other punishments is there evidence that it works as a deterrent do all criminals get a free trial who are these criminals what is their socio economic background are the supreme court guidelines on rarest of rare cases actually followed so we have experts like vijay hiremat anup surendranath who will be looking at uh, these issues then we find that most of the death penalty convicts stay on the death row for many many years so that itself creates a number of what does it impact on their health especially the mental health is that a concern today of the criminal justice system or even healthcare professionals who are expected to sort of treat them so we have uh, somitra patharin maitri uh, mishra and uh, sandeep mahamni who will be talking about the mental health issues and then what is of special interest to the forum for medical ethics society is the role of healthcare professionals in both execution of a death penalty and in creating a constructive dialogue around the uh, death penalty because fmes has always worked very closely with medical practitioners healthcare professionals so it is interested in finding out what is expected of them what are their attitudes and perspectives about this role what is the guidance given to them currently in law 
by their medical associations and what are the expectations of the state from them. for inviting me for this uh, program, very important uh, on the issue of constitutionality and death penalty. And um, speaking here in this college also is a bit nostalgic. My teachers are here, Jaya ma'am, Patulkar ma'am, and many years ago when I passed out, this room was a reading room, which has now been converted into a conference room. I stayed in the hostel for three years, so a lot of memories with friends here. Anyway, so... Uh, for somebody who is a student of constitution, it's very clear that that sentence violates the constitution, though in a sense it has been approved by the constitution. It's not only anecdotal but very well researched and documented and also it has come out through various judgments that, this, that the procedure which has been established by law which says that can take away the life of a person needs to be examined whether this procedure itself is fair, it's equal to everyone and whether it's a mere formality that is being followed when there are preconceived notions of and the objectives to be achieved to please the majority sentiments at a given point of time. It's also very important to see whether these procedures at various levels bring in any kind of discrimination on, of people who are facing the criminal justice system through various ways. According to me, there are various failures in the system and the procedures laid down itself. And that's the, another main reason why that penalty should be held unconstitutional. <laughs> the first and foremost would be the issue of equality and discrimination. It's very well established, again through research, judgments, there are reports of uh, the death penalty center and also questions asked not only in the parliament by the president itself uh, at one point of time that why is it that only marginalized people or poor people are on death row or why are the only poor people who have been so far have been executed. We have not seen any cases where I would say upper class or upper caste people also are given that sentence as regularly as the uh, marginalized sections of the society. Discrimination regarding the people starts within the criminal justice system right from the time of arrest till probably somebody gets executed. And unless they are lucky enough to find some good lawyers or me, come across Project 39 people or Yuk Chaudhary, they sometimes they might just get hanged. And there are instances which I will come to where people have been hanged wrongly on wrong judgments of Supreme Court and even today the Supreme Court has acknowledged that in the judgments that yes, these judgments were wrong but it has done nothing to overcome these things and that to acknowledge that these judgments were wrong and some people have been hanged wrongly is another ground I would say that death penalty should be held unconstitutional. There is no way that Supreme Court can say yes we made a mistake but we still continue this on the books because it is there and leave it to the parliament. This thing. They know that they have made mistakes and these systemic mistakes are not going to change the procedure laid down and way the way this discrimination happens is not going to change for a long time and I don't think it will ever change looking at the society or looking at the times we live in. The quality of legal assistance for person at the trial stage to the appellate stage is something which is wanting in all these cases. The kind of legal aid that is given is pathetic is the word which I would say. Just look at compare the fees that are given. If a special, Generally in all these cases a special counsel is appointed. In Maharashtra we have only one. And uh, the fees of this uh, special counsel for the entire case 
for the per day hearing it's not given even for the entire day uh, entire case for the legal aid counsel so suppose as minimum as 10000 rupees is given per day to the special counsel that is not even the fee that the legal aid get aid counsel gets for the entire case this thing his fees is somewhere around 7000 to between 10000 rupees for the entire case where there are number of witnesses examined like the case we have in hand right now is minimum witnesses is about 37 witnesses and these cases go on for years this thing the photocopying expenses it might come more than 10000 rupees this thing so what are we looking at isn't this a discrimination because somebody just because can has the money has uh, can afford a good counsel uh, doesn't face that penalty but somebody who da, has to go to the state legal aid board uh, faces uh, that penalty so where is the equality and then if the case is of terror or a case of rape murder child the media attention itself on these cases has already proved the accused guilty even before the trial has started and what remains to the judge is many times a mere formality to decide what is the sentence many of these cases happen trial at 9 o'clock on television somebody gets arrested somebody's names are taken on few channels and already the entire country decides yes the person is guilty and then what remains for the judge is to decide the sentence any person who has worked with the criminal justice system in any manner at any level i would say would admit that the system is unfair and discrimination is rampant though the discrimination may not be overt is the systemic discrimination which cannot be done away with very easily if this systemic discrimination cannot be done away with that penalty is unfair unconstitutional as the constitution says there should not be any kind of discrimination recently a case has been argued in the supreme court of the shinde brothers and this is a famous case of nasik of rape and murder of 1999 six brothers of the same family were arrested all cousins some are real brothers also amongst the family now these people have been inside for 20 years they are a mercy by the state government was rejected the reviews were rejected only by a, by luck the mohammad arif judgment came and the reviews were filed again and they had a hearing again in the open court and in all likelihood the supreme court is shocked by the kind of evidence on which they were about to be hanged they were their lives were literally hanging by the thread and the supreme court has heard the matter they have stayed the execution and these people have spent 20 years in custody and nearly 18 years on death row now amongst them was a juvenile whose juvenility application came to be heard and he was decided that he was it was decided that he was juvenile only in the year 2014 and till the case went to the supreme court nobody ever raised a question that this boy may might be a juvenile at the time of uh, committing the offense even the supreme court the supreme court has regularly in its judgment said that death penalty should be there because even if the errors are committed by the lower court we are there to take care of the er errors the high court is there to take care of the er errors the supreme court is there to take care of the errors this juvenile if not brought to the lawyers notice or some researcher who went into the jail and just happened to by chance look at the documents and get him out on uh, as as a juvenile this juvenile would have been hanged this thing and these are the grave errors the system is making and this itself is a discrimination on which the penalty should go away well the judicial discretion is another important aspect which i feel is should be another ground where it should be held unconstitutional the amnesty india report talks that death penalty is a lethal lottery in present times the courts are itself a lethal lottery we it all depends on with whom 
who is the judge hearing the case who the judge uh, who, who what the bench is constituted about it is very little many times about the law the lawyer or the person or the evidence it is completely a judge oriented system and where there is so much given in the hands of the judges where same set of evidence uh, one bench will decide in a different way the other bench will decide in a different way so in such a situation i don't think where objectivity can be seen only through evidence that penalty should be there like the bhullar's case fortunately he was later saved on the grounds of mental health because he remained on uh, death row for a long time in bhullar's case when the finally the slp was decided by the supreme court two of the judges gave him that sentence but the other judge said acquit him so look at the disparity one judge said there is no evidence enough that he can be even convicted but the two other judges say that he should be hanged this thing so the judicial discretion is something which needs to be looked into and something which itself it should be a, become a ground for challenging the constitutionality there are several judgments of the supreme court of course the now the situation has changed since 2014 after mohammad arif's case till 2014 many of the slps where the persons were given death penalties were thrown out on a single line by the supreme court saying that no merit no discussion on merit no discussion on the crime that was committed no discussion on the mitigating circumstances no discussion on why that penalty should be given only these two lines two words no merit and slp dismissed there were several cases they are all getting reopened after mohammad arif's case thanks to the mohammad arif's judgment where now they said that if any review is filed in any of the cases of death penalty they all should be heard in an open court so many of these cases where there was a two line dismissal now lawyers have filed for review of these cases and they are coming up before the court the shinde brothers case was also in one of the slps was where the brothers had filed separately was a two line dismissal so you treat life of a person especially a poor person because many times these are you are not taking a top lawyer from the supreme court who will go and argue the case and that's why these things happen if a top lawyer goes and obviously they are not going to dismiss it in two lines and why this is a discrimination which works because of class because of caste and this is a major problem with the kind of judicial system kind of criminal system, uh, justice system we work in today there is a major problem which the supreme court had on its hand and which they have i feel not rectified so far since there was a case of rauji rauji in which the supreme court overturned completely the bachchan singh principles actually the but in bachchan singh's case the supreme court had said that when you give death sentence you don't only look at the crime that has been committed but look at the criminals and the circumstances around him look at what the mitigating circumstances look at the cr criminal also in rauji's case the court said do, you do not have to look at the crime uh, look at the criminal and the circumstances only look at the crime and decide whether that sentence has to be given or not and on basis of rauji's case there are several judgments passed where people have been given that sentence one of the cases which Dr. Patari is handling is of Mohan Anna Chavan again on a Rauji case where after then came the case of Santosh Bariyar after Rauji again recently in 2011 where first time the Supreme Court said Rauji's case was per incurium to Bachchan Singh's case because Bachchan Singh's case was a five judge bench and Rauji's case was two judge bench and hence Rauji's case is wrong. and you have to follow the principles laid down in bachchan singh but what happens to all those cases which were decided on rauji's principles rauji himself has been hanged on that and this error how will the supreme court ever rectify this is a irreversible um, punishment and uh, you have made such glaring mistakes on the several mercy petitions were filed by myself and dr choudhury before the maharashtra government on basis that since rauji was a wrong precedent and in all these cases rauji's 
uh, precedent was used and that sentence was given, you, uh, you grant mercy. But the Maharashtra government has rejected all these mercy petitions. Not a single mercy petition has been allowed. Of course, some of the cases now are being reviewed by the Supreme Court. But these are the, some of the seven or eight cases which we came to know. We don't know about the other cases. The other aspect is of the investigation. The police is always in a great hurry to finish the investigation. Catch anybody at the first instance because a major crime has been committed. You have to do something. So it doesn't matter whether you are catching an innocent person, you are catching somebody who may not have committed the crime. It's all that they have to catch somebody and show that this thing. In the case of Rajiv Gandhi's murder case, they did sim something similar. Uh, Tada allowed confessions and on that basis the death sentence was given. Now when the case went to Supreme Court, there was some mistake in taking the confessions but the court said that we will go by the confessions and convict under IPC. Completely illegal under IPC, you can't take confessions but the court went ahead and granted death penalty and that case also still on the hands of the Supreme Court. In one of the, like the conferences on death penalty, one of the judges who was presiding over the bench at that point of time was asked by, not by activists or us, people like us, but by some of the retired Supreme Court judges and High Court judges, saying that how did you do this Rajiv Gandhi's case? How did you give that sentence looking at the confession could not have been taken? into IPC. His answer was, Prime Minister of a country had been killed. The, co the entire country was looking at us. What did you expect me to do? Give him life imprisonment so that these guys come out after 14 years? No, I had to give that sentence. And these guys, these people are still on death row. Nobody has touched that case ever. Um, while retiring recently, Justice Kurian Joseph, looking at the um, uh, Law Commission report, has again said that death penalty as, an, as a punishment has failed in the country. It has not worked as a deterrent, which has been again and, and again said in several of the judgments where constitutionality were challenged. But none of these judges, none of these judgments have ultimately uh, uh, thrown out that penalty. They say that there, there is higher judiciary, there are mechanisms within the systems which can take care of the problems that may happen. They acknowledge the problems. It is not that they don't acknowledge the problem. They acknowledge the problems, but they are unwilling to work on these issues at all. Uh, I won't go in the specifics when it was challenged and uh, this thing. Only time where in two instances it has been struck down that penalty is the case of mandatory death sentence in the case of Mithu where section 303 has been struck down and later in the by Bombay High Court in the case of Indian Harm Reduction Network where in cases of narcotic drugs where there was mandatory death sentence for a second conviction that the death penalty has been struck down. Strangely when there is these judgments are there the court has laid down, mandatory death sentence has been again brought in after case of Nirbhaya, where they say that if, um, the, if, the, if there is a second conviction for rape, then that person should be given that sentence. Again, that is a challenge which is in the Shakti Mills case is pending before the High Court. I mean that. So, I mean, looking at all these circumstances, the kind of judges we have, kind of uh, system we are working with, uh, there is no place that we can keep that penalty on the books and should not be kept on the books. I don't know when the challenge, when actually it will go away, whether it will have to be a legislation, whether it, the finally the courts will arise to the occasion, but it has to go away. Thank you.
dubstep forward. She faces suspicion and judgment. The case drags on for years. The child is subjected to harsh questioning and is forced to relive her trauma again and again. Her identity is often disclosed. She is constantly exposed to bereavement. And most of the time, the court does not convict the abused. This does lasting damage to the child. She faces stigma, judgment, and blame. She may drop out of school and may be forced to relocate. And in the end, families are often left with little support. Now, what happens when the death penalty is introduced into this system? The trial will be even longer, even harsher, and much more traumatic. Faced with the guilt of sending a known person to the gallery, the child and her family are much less likely to report. Hence, there will not be fewer rapes, only fewer rapes reported, and fewer survivors. What do we actually need? We need the investigation and court procedure to be child free. We need victim protection programs. We need to train and sensitize judges, lawyers, and police officials. And most of all, we need education and awareness programs to challenge the attitudes that lead to inequality and violence. Here's the good news. Existing laws already have many of these provisions, but their implementation needs to be stricter and wider. And that's what we need to focus on, instead of pursuing a drastic measure like the death penalty. There is no easy solution to this complex problem. But we don't need any research. We need the right one. Popularity of the death penalties in India rides on the back of uh, uh, the response to sexual violence and terrorism. I just thought uh, we, uh, it was useful to play this more as to understand the complexity of the issue, but also as a strategy uh, that we adopted to work with child rights groups uh, uh, in, in developing this message. Uh, anyway, the complex questions of uh, how do you look at impact of these things? Uh, who should you reach out to? All those are much complex questions around public communication and very important in building a strategy uh, in response to the death penalty. So I'll leave that there for now. Uh, in terms of the death penalty and uh, in India's criminal justice system, I think there's a fundamental confusion on both sides of the debate on why do we have the death penalty. And uh, uh, we often, uh, I think both sides are not entirely honest at all points of time in terms of what are they responding to. I don't think it is only about deterrence, uh, it, that, that, that it's about preventing future crime. I think there are com complex uh, philosophical questions on what is wrong with society seeking collective revenge, right? Uh, what is so wrong about it? If, if there is the Delhi gang rape case, uh, this, the death penalty might not be about saying we want to prevent such future crimes, uh, or we might, this is not what the people who committed the crime deserve, in that sense, the je just deserts theory. It might just be a very bold need and cry for social revenge. What is so wrong with that? And then very often we, uh, the, the, the abolitionist side does not want to answer that question, right? It just does not want to develop a frame to that uh, question in terms of our constitutional framework as to why can't, why is social revenge such a bad thing, right? And, and, and I think there's some need to uh, discuss that issue. Um, and then I'll park that for now. Uh, the second is this whole uh, system and framework developed in Bachchan Singh uh, called rarest of the rare. Everybody thinks they know what it means. Uh, that, of course, it's the rarest of the rare means that the crime is rare. Anybody who, re who has read the judgment closely will know it is not that. Uh, it's not about how rare is the crime, right? Um, and, and, and very interestingly, this is not just about lay persons or law researchers or uh, people in government. Uh, we, we completed a study with 60 former judges of the Supreme Court on asking them what are their views on the criminal justice system and the death penalty. 
part of that study with 60 former Supreme Court judges uh, was to ask them what do they understand as the rarest of the rare system. And it is it was shocking to see the sheer inconsistency in what they thought was the meaning of the rarest of the rare. And these are people who have decided death sentence cases both in the high courts and in the Supreme Court. Equally stunning was the proportion of, people, of those judges who believed torture was justified in a system like ours. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that question later. So in this understanding of this framework of the rarest of the rare, there is a lot of judicial confusion. The judicial confusion is right at the top. The confusion gets signaled down to the high courts. And, and we're just about to complete a study of how trial courts uh, in uh, Madhya Pradesh, in Maharashtra and Delhi have looked at rarest of the rare. Because, of course, it's, 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 it's not sexy to study trial courts in Indian legal academia, right? Uh, every, all the focus is on the Supreme Court. Right? So we looked at trial death sentences in trial courts for the last 15 years in these, in these states. And, it, and, and I don't think I blame the trial judges. When the Supreme Court is not able to provide that kind of doctrinal coherence and doctrinal clarity, the, kind, the manner in which the rarest of rare framework has completely collapsed in the courts below is not a surprise. Right? And, and the statistics show over the last 15 years uh, uh, over the last 15 years uh, that for every 100 death sentences that trial courts give last year uh, in 2018 uh, we'd seen the highest number of death sentences we just released the annual statistics on that 162 death sentences in 2018 by Indian trial courts highest in over two decades in nearly two decades in 19 years uh, last year was the highest but what happens to these death sentences right Ultimately, as they travel through the system, right, uh, about 5% of those death sentences are confirmed by the Supreme Court, right? Uh, and, and it is even that 5% that uh, the report that Vijay was talking about, Lethal Lottery, shows you that even that 5% is rife with arbitrariness and all sorts of problems. Even that 5% that gets confirmed. What must really worry us as a system is that for every 100 death sentences that the trial courts have given over the last uh, 15 or 18 years, 30% move from a death sentence to an acquittal, right? From death sentence to an acquittal. Now, that must worry us as a system. That is no indication that the system is working. On the contrary, it is an indication that the system is failing to such an extent that you're giving death sentence on extremely dodgy evidence that courts themselves feel compelled uh, to overturn, right? So, so this whole idea that, you know, what is wrong with the death penalty, you know, we give it only in the rarest of rare doctrine, is a complete uh, slate of hand because the courts, it's a system that is no longer judicially maintainable because it is what it means to each one of us, right? Uh, it is, uh, and, and the kind of justifications uh, that uh, judges give is really shocking in these judgments, uh, completely uh, outside their realm of their jurisdiction, uh, the kind of role that they assume in society. Uh, it's as though judges are free to do whatever they want within this framework because it is an, like an empty vessel that you fill with anything that you want, right? Um, one of the crucial elements of uh, rarest of rare in the framework that is developed in Bachin Singh, and I just touch on two is this idea that you must present mitigation information, right? That in part of that balancing exercise, when judges have to choose between life imprisonment and uh, the death sentence, the law, the, the framework in Bachchan Singh says you have to balance aggravating and mitigating circumstances. Now, how are these mitigating circumstances going to be presented before court? And what are these mitigating circumstances? It's essentially you have to present the life history of that person, right? Now, given the profile of people that we're talking about, which are extremely poor people, terrible legal representation, right? Who is going to present, the law requires that mitigation information be presented. And if you look at these tons and tons of case law on, on, death, on, on death sentence, there is no discussion from the Supreme Court as to how is 
this information to be collected? What is the consequence of such information not being collected? Is, is, would it vitiate the fair trial rights when you say that sufficient mitigation investigation has not been done into the background of the offender? And who is to do this back investigation, right? It's, it's something that we try and do in our cases. It is, it is expensive. It is time consuming. It is ethically very challenging, right? Because prisons allow only 20 minutes a week. Uh, like Pune, for example, it is 20 minute meetings twice a week, right? To build that kind of confidence in the client to talk to you and reveal their darkest secrets. You know, we all assume that if you go and talk there, they will immediately start bearing out uh, uh, their darkest secrets. You know, it's, it's, it's a very complex dynamic. It's one of shame. It is one of fear. It's one of, will this lawyer just abandon me if I tell them that I raped and murdered a child brutally? Right? Finally, they have, somebody has come and uh, is talking to me and wants to know about my life. Now, should I tell them that I raped and murdered a child? Will they just leave me? So these are very... And, and question as lawyers and as social workers... Uh, is to say, do you, do you go and ask the family about all of this? Do you re-traumatize them? Uh, what, what are you offering when you have these conversations? So this, when the law says bring mitigation information, the law is not concerned with how this mitigation information will be brought, given the kind of people that we're talking about, and what are the consequences of not bringing that mitigation information, right? Uh, in, and the second requirement within Bachchan Singh is, and as, as, as those of you might be following this debate closely, a lot of death penalty decisions from the Supreme Court in the last three, four months, right? This question of reformation. And now this is where strategizing death penalty litigation is so difficult. In many of our cases that we, we litigated in the last few months, we presented positive information about what prisoners had done in in various parts of the country, right? Death row prisoners that were in court. They had studied, they had written poetry, they had done art. Now, the consequence of this is that now judges are starting to say, show me positive information that this person has done something worthwhile in prison, right? You're saying this person is there, in, uh, has been in prison for eight years or 10 years. What has he or she done? A, prison conditions vary across different parts of the country. Uh, many prisons don't allow death row prisoners to study. They don't allow them to interact with uh, the general prison population. They don't allow them to take part in prison act general prison activities. And it's a, it's a fundamental misreading of the law to say that the burden of showing reformation is on the prisoner. Bachchan Singh clearly says that reformation is a valid criteria and the burden is on the state, right? What is the burden on the state? The burden is on the state to show that this person cannot be reformed. Now, judge, the moment you present this argument, judges are like, but you tell me, how will they show that? How will they show that? Now, and I think at some point, some lawyer is going to have to muster up the courage to tell them, that your job as judges upholding the constitution is not to find a way to give the death penalty. Right? It is not to say, how can we give the death penalty? Right? You tell me how, in what cases the death penalty can be given. If the state is so interested in taking a person's life, it must be that onerous on the state to show that this person is beyond reformation. The burden cannot be shifted to the prisoner to show that that you've done something great in uh, uh, in prison, right? Now, in terms of fair trial rights, in, in terms of fair trial rights, if you look, you know, Section 27 of the Indian Evidence Act is something that requires very serious constitutional reconsideration. Its validity has been upheld by 11 judge bench. Uh, uh, in the 60s, uh, <coughs> but it is one provision that invites torture-based evidence through the back door, right? Uh, the amount that and 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 and, and it's a complex issue. There is no <coughs> point blaming the police forces or the investigating agencies. Our police force investigating agencies are are colonial relics. Uh, modernizing and making those investigation agencies independent has never been a political priority. 
and therefore they're largely left with using torture as a mechanism ably supported by Section 27 of the Evidence Act uh, to, to, to do that. Um, and, and, and therefore much of the evidence in death penalty cases, and that, I don't think that's exclusive to death penalty cases, is based on uh, torture. Um, and I'm not getting into the mechanics of Section 27, and we can discuss it if, there's, if anybody's interested. Um, legal representation, right? Uh, we just spoke about it as well. Um, a very, very critical issue uh, of, you know, the constitutional position is that there is a right to legal aid, there is a right to free legal aid, but again, our courts have never developed a jurisprudence on what is that quality of that legal aid that you're entitled to. They've been happy. The jurisprudence around the right to legal aid has been very uh, uh, conveniently restricted to saying that you have a right to a lawyer, right? But the, the jurisprudence is so weak on in terms of assessing the quality of legal assistance that you have received. Uh, and, and really, without developing that jurisprudence, we, re we can... We can uh, talk about this till the cows come home, uh, right? But uh, unless you develop that, you really can't give meaningful effect to the right to legal aid. Um, many of you might have read uh, Madhya Pradesh's prosecution policy. Madhya Pradesh basically uh, pushed the, even before the, the Kathua and Unao cases was pushing for the amendment of the IPC to give death penalty for child rape. They combined that with a uh, prosecutorial policy, which basically started to reward prosecutors for every death sentence that they got, right? Now that flies in the face of this entire idea that the prosecution is to be independent. You're basically incentivizing the prosecutor seeking death. Yes, in practice, effectively, I guess all prosecutors seek death, but for the state to start incentivizing the death penalty is adversely impacting prosecutorial independence, right? And, and uh, the first case using that prosecutorial policy is now in the Supreme Court with the death sentence confirmed by uh, the Madhya Pradesh High Court uh, and, 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 and hopefully we'll put up a fair challenge, constitutional challenge to that prosecutorial policy. I think that, but I think the larger question really that we must locate this debate in is really where are we going as a polity on the use of criminal law, right? Our answer to very serious social problems seems to be harsher and harsher criminal law. The expanding domain of what we are criminalizing. And you can see, you can see that in the triple talaq discussion, right? That we see, or we can see that in the punishment, uh, in, in, in the sort of host of enhanced punishments for cow slaughter, some states have life imprisonment uh, for illegal cow slaughter, right? So this uh, this expanding realm of criminal law, right? And and in what case, what should we criminalize? And how much must we criminalize? And how much must we punish? Are very fundamental questions that we need to answer if we're really to take this death penalty conversation forward. Thank you. Discussion. We're talking about the ground reality. So, again, a lot of law students here, and we're going to put in a very field. So, which we can get a good discussion going on this. And today, we have immediate three questions. And then, all of you can answer. And then we can come back. Overall, I mean, not only about the death penalty. Is there anything we can do? Can we have a parallel system as it was earlier, like jury system, wherein some uh, judgments could be evaluated by a uh, very kind of uh, optimal sampling? And the parallel system could be, you know, started. Of course, it's, it seems to be a very, uh, you know, remote uh, idea kind of a thing. But uh, could uh, something be done by law commission, or could we look into this part? Well, judicial discretion is is a problem in every area, almost every area. You want highlights about what kind of challenges to all this arbitrariness that we heard are planned, like any. 
challenges to the amendments uh, or what other action is being planned very broadly i i disagree with the dominant understanding of arbitrariness in the lbt sentence the dominant framework is that you map you show similar crimes that have resulted in dissimilar outcomes right you say okay now i will show you 10 cases where there is rape and murder of a 5 year old uh, that has resulted in death and i will show you 10 other cases of rape and murder of 5 year old that has not resulted in and therefore there an argument is made that this is arbitrary and i disagree with that right and the reason why i disagree with that is that that buys into a logic that death penalty sentencing is crime central right it buys into that logic that death penalty sentencing should be crime centric that similar crimes must result in similar outcomes but that is not the framework in bachan singh that it is not about just comparing that all crimes must get similar punishment right and 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 what bachan singh requires is that the crime has to be matched against individual mitigating circumstances so it's entirely possible to have x and y having committed the same crime the same crime as in let's say rape and murder of a 5 year old having very different individual mitigating circumstances and therefore constitutionally possible within the realm of bachan singh to have different outcomes in those cases so the arbitrariness for me is really about the lack of consistency in bringing forth mitigation information there is no consistency in saying how will you bring about mitigation information how will you evaluate mitigation information what weightage will you attribute to mitigating circumstances there is no consistency on that and that for me is the core of the arbitrariness problem in death penalty sentencing as opposed to the sort of uh the line that the uh, lethal lottery report flirts with in terms of taking a very crime centric uh thing we will compare crime sensi outcome and therefore i mean i it's i while i while it's while it's a good easy sell it's an easy sell saying okay two crimes same crimes with similar outcomes arbitrariness is a great two minute sell right and 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 i see that appeal strategically but uh jurisprudentially i have a disagreement with And, and, and yeah, I know I'm not asking a question of what challenges are planned. Uh, and very quickly, I would say that before the constitutional challenge to the death penalty, I think we will see incremental challenges to other parts of the administration of the death penalty, uh, smaller and smaller challenges, uh, constitutional challenges that make it more and more difficult to give the death penalty. And the logic behind that is uh, you don't, and the and the two arguments you don't want to. today challenge the death penalty and i have its constitutionality upheld uh because then if it's upheld you're off, you're again put off by 40 years you can't keep bringing a constitutional challenge every 5 years like right? bachan singh is 1980 uh we almost 40 years since then yes the time is coming close but uh, i don't think we are ready we need to have a lot of empirical evidence uh that the court must be forced to engage with unlike bachan singh where it's a very political philosophical discussion and therefore it's up for grabs uh that's one thing uh and second as you make it more and more difficult by the smaller challenges then every time that you do give a death sentence it will appear more and more freakish right that's the whole logic that you make it more and more and more and more difficult and then when they do give one you say that okay you have it given a uh, a death sentence has been upheld in so long and why is it give, being upheld for this person but i think you will see the whole host of challenges before the big one yeah just uh, to take that point for forward of the challenges i feel the challenges will also have to be made not only to the uh, administration of death sentence and the smaller aspects but to the various aspects of the criminal justice system that we are uh, uh, working with today section 27 of the evidence act which uh, is a backdoor entry for torture so at various levels these challenges which are ultimately culminate into this uh, challenge to the death penalty 
Now answering the first question, I don't think we'll have to go back to the, I don't know, I don't agree with this whole jury system in India. And uh, there are uh, problems with that also. But this, what needs to be done regarding discretion, controlling the discretion of the judiciary in terms of uh, this thing. I personally say, we are, irrespective of whether the death penalty is there or not, that there has to be a sentencing policy. There has to be some legislation on that one. Today we don't have it. And that is where this whole discretion comes, where you say from three years to life imprisonment. Where does this person fit in? On what basis do you decide between three years to life imprisonment? This thing. And the matter is to be tried by a magistrate court. He doesn't even have, a, have the power to give life imprisonment. So there is a lot of problems with the uh, statutes. There is a lot of problems with the sentencing. And as long as you don't have a sentencing policy, these problems will keep arising. The doctors normally say they take more medicine you become better. <laughs> and the lawyer says that there will be more laws so that uh, no, the judiciary will say stay out of the court. Uh, <laughs> I'm quite cynical about both of them. So uh, yeah. I know I, I, I'm not getting convinced uh, uh, that to what extent uh, your uh, legal activism will succeed. Yeah. Uh, the reason I, I feel is that uh, when there is a massive support within the civil society, Killing hmm. to take revenge. Now, to uh, insulate the judiciary from this strong, you know, viewpoint of the people is extremely difficult. You know, look at America, USA. Much of the uh, death penalty sustenance there comes from the from the people supporting it. So, what I was wondering is that uh, uh, to what extent uh, the legal activism on its own is going to achieve the results that you want. And how far? You know, we haven't done, done much work. And I, I, I can look at all the human rights organizations that I know of, and I know most of them in India. Almost none of them has death penalties on, on, on the priority list of their agenda. Now, unless we reach out to those sections of the society, the minorities, the Dalits, now, these are the people who you think and, and your, your data show that they are suffering from. Now, how do you get them to collaborate and be part of this network to, to really create a, an opinion which can ultimately influence the judges and all? I, this is, a, I think, a, a very important area which we seem to be neglecting and, and putting too much emphasis on, on the law becoming a savior for us. The other area is also, I mean, when you're talking about judicial <coughs> reform, to what extent uh, the domination of the <coughs> high caste, uh, uh, you know, yes. within the judicial system really plays out, you know, their background, their uh, aspirations, understanding of, of, of people's actual lives play out in, in their, their frequently pronouncing uh, the kind of judgments that they are doing. I think that the job of the constitutional courts is not to give in to the, all these majoritarian demands or this thing. And that is why it's not question of insulating. It is the question of exactly where these judges are coming from, what is the background, who is making them judges, and whether they can read into the constitution and not go by just what the majority wants. And it is not that we don't have examples before us that they have brushed aside the majority uh, opinions and gone ahead with the, uh, upholding, upholding the constitution. There have been instances, of course, few and between, but uh, there are, and that is a challenge, I feel, more than uh, this thing. Of course, getting the communities together um, and putting forth the idea is also equally important, but I think that is more challenging than making the judges read the constitution. Because, uh, see, let's look at the cases today in Maharashtra. There is a girl raped, Ma Maratha girl raped by a Dalit. The entire Maratha community wants that sentence. You go to a different district, there a Dalit girl is uh, raped by a Maratha and killed. The entire Dalit community wants uh, that sentence to be. So, how are we going to bring these communities together and say that you should not ask for that sentence? I think it's very, very difficult in the present scenario. I have a pet line on this of what Dr. Jasani was saying that 
because the death penalty almost seems like a five star battle in a society like ours right uh, and i say that because uh, life is so fundamentally devalued uh, mm-hmm. that it doesn't shock us that people lose life to hunger a cold heat rain um, and extrajudicial executions right it doesn't shock us and i so i'm completely in agreement with you that that we operate in a sort of social framework where uh, that 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 value that is attached that secret value that is attached to life is missing and therefore it is going to find reflection in the judiciary what is the role for uh, uh, um, i don't share the extent of your skepticism about legal intervention and i'll i'll, I'll explain that uh, is that i think that civil society engagement is very necessary uh but i don't think that will form the backbone of doing away with the death penalty uh what it is necessary that engagement is necessary to the extent of saying that uh when the judiciary as and when the judiciary or parliament does away with it right and no election in this country is going to turn on its head because some party decides it wants to do away with it it's not i mean i don't think anybody who read this Uh, indian politics would think that if a party says they want to abolish the death penalty you know that uh, uh, their fortunes in an election will uh, but anyway i don't but the point i'm making is the abolition of the death penalty is never going to be on the back of majority of the population wanting it has never been the history of abolition uh, that in countries that have abolished it uh, the majority population has supported that but we do need that engagement for to the extent of saying that when that abolition does come and hopefully it will come uh there is that backlash is not there of of asking and demanding for it and uh that you create that uh you temper that environment for social revenge that when it does come through it will and then i don't see it as escaping that it will be a top down abolition that there is no adverse uh reaction to that uh amongst the public and the american experience is interesting the steadily falling support for the death penalty is on the back of the innocence project i mean it uh, it, it it can't uh it's of of uh that the innocence project has done so much to question so the innocence project basically is um uh, of sort of this initiative that has shown that many death penalty cases and not just death penalty cases but also death penalty cases those who have been executed and who continue to be on death row were innocent when they committed the crime that they didn't commit the crime and it has been on the back of lot of dna uh, uh, dna evidence they have taken out the old evidence done new dna analysis looked at what kind of junk science was used in these trials also i think it comes from the skepticism that it's not going to come through a movement movement yeah so i think that is one of the reasons where movements have not led towards yeah because we speak to our seniors also they have said that listen i think it will come only through the movement we have outsourced it to you <laughs> <laughs> also to add to this is it that we really i mean like being the devil advocate here okay that that a lot of middle class values are there in activism today and if we are going to stick our neck out and fight for a cause why should it be for people who have committed a crime is that also a kind of thinking that is there so we kind of disconnected then from the broader culture of violence that is i'm sure i mean as i'm sure many people in this room will testify the feminist movement in india itself is not agreed on the death penalty question neither is the child rights movement right uh, and and these are two critical uh, interest groups that have a lot that that must have a lot to say about the death penalty and there is no agreement sure and i know sure we will sort of can talk more about it from the dhananjay days the in, the feminist movement in india has traveled a significant distance you have to explain the things like that because right things like budget thing i don't know yeah i'm sorry go ahead so in the dhananjay strategy the case on west bengal uh, uh rape and murder of uh, a 16 year old 16 or 17 year old girl very serious questions of innocence after his execution but at that point one reads that i am student law school then uh that there was 
great support amongst fem the feminist movement and, and marches taken in the streets of Calcutta by uh, feminist groups asking for the death penalty for Dhanajar Chatterjee. I think that has significantly changed over the years and I think there's far more uh, uh, resistance to the death penalty with, within the feminist movement in India. But I don't think, at least from at, it's only an external sense, but I don't think the issue is settled within the groups themselves, and uh, and I think that's a very serious challenge. Uh, and even and and the larger politics of the global abolition movement, right? And and sort of plugged into that is how little conversation there is in that global abolition movement. Uh, like there's a World Congress against the death penalty uh, next week. How sexual violence is not really on the agenda. Right? Because uh, what is driving the death penalty in other parts of the world in which the global abolition movement is interested in is either drugs or mandatory death penalty or China as an issue in itself, right? Given the very large numbers of execution. Sexual violence are, seems to be a very peculiar uh, experience where it's on the back of uh, a response to sexual violence and therefore it's, yeah, it's a complex civil society uh, situation. No, no, yeah. Also, this whole public opinion debate itself is, I feel, a kind of a myth that is created by the uh, by the people who can't take charge or control of the situation. Like, like Nirbhaya happened. What did you do later? Nobody questions them to me. Safeguard women in the country. Is women safer by bringing in these punishments? So these are the questions which probably women's oh. movement or child rights movement have to ask, which are, I think, not being asked to the uh, to the authorities or to the legislature. Because just bringing in the punishment, we all know, nothing is changing at the ground level. And this whole, that's why this public opinion wants it, is itself a myth. I feel that, like in Bachchan Singh case, they talk of mitigating circumstances, which, you know, which helps you to understand this issue. We should also look at the bias, prejudice and stereotype in the judiciary. You know, when he's sitting there and giving judgments, like Rama said, you cannot, you cannot just ignore the class and the caste issue when the judge sits there and gives judgment. I mean, in the court where we have been on both the sides, you know. So I think one of the challenges is that when you when you are talking about the civil society, like today, if I go out and talk to the media or even to friends saying that Kasab should not have been and they say sedition ka charge laga do uske bhi. You know, so that hyper nationality which is there. In the civil society, one has to work when we are doing this activism. How do we work with the civil society and be able to raise these questions without, you know, people being scared of doing it? So I, I mean, I also train. So there are a lot of trainings in the judicial academy where very rarely they call for to deal with bias and prejudices amongst the judiciary. How it works, and when you do an experiential psychological exercises to show them that yes, this bias and prejudice works. That, that is a time when people may think about it. The same thing in the civil society, you know. I mean, when a, when a, uh, when there is rape, people say that so-and-so girl has been raped in so-and-so and so thing. But if a party rapes a non, uh, you know, uh, tribal or somebody, then the, the news that comes is a party rapes a 16-year-old and the whole party community is being attacked everywhere. So, it's also... The mindset and the bias and prejudice in the society at large of the media of the judiciary. So I think that is also challenge. How does one look at these bias and prejudices, which works and which also is not bringing about a movement which should come about? You know, if today I say something, there will not be many people who will support that this person should not be hanged. The the immediate conclusion would be that you are in favor of people who are doing this crime. So there has to be a way in which one has to introduce these ideas. Different questions that I want to pose like on what grounds is the abolitionist movement running? On the backbone of which ground? Because what I heard of, of this discussion was mainly the latter, where you are criticizing the judicial process and investigation procedure and the discrimination, not exactly whether the existence itself is an ethical and moral question, the question of state-sanctioned murder. Secondly, the proportion, like there is a principle in, in criminal law that every sentence like is proportional to the crime that is committed. So in death penalty, there are around seven to eight offenses which have been listed in Bachchan Singh, which are which do have death penalty. 
including the Fox's or Naudi amendment. So I'd like to ask us to, when you look at the question of proportionality to the crime itself committed, do you really think that the very existence of death penalty, assuming that institutional machinery is in place, is still wrong and is still unethical? Not to box in the judicial discretion. But then three years down the line in Machi Singh, exactly the three judge bench <coughs> went ahead and boxed the judicial discretion by listing those five offenses. At the state of the victim, etc., etc. We all know about it, manner, motive. So, bye bye judicial discretion. Machi Singh was quoted by repeated judgments down the line. What Bachi <coughs> Singh judgment refused to do. They did the same, Machi Singh, <coughs> boxing in the judicial discussion. Bachan Singh also mentioned that we don't want to box in judicial discussion. We don't want to restrict the applicability of death penalty. Mitigating, aggravating is fine. But ultimately, we leave it to the concerned judge. Reason being, if you trust the history of CRPC from 1898 till 1955, Death was the rule and life was the exception <coughs> for all convictions under 302. And the trial judge, or the sentencing judge, I would say, had to give reasons why he has not passed death penalty for a murder crime. Post 55 amendment, of course, then the views changed <coughs> and the judge was expected to give reasons why he has passed the death sentence. And then, of course, came 1973. Post Furman versus Georgia and USA, and then the new code, which introduced in uh, section 354, subsection 3 of CRPC, the phrase called special reasons. And then the Bachan bench went on to elaborate on what the legislators mean by special reasons. And then they developed the principle of the rest of rare. And this is what the special reasons mean. And pre Bachan saying, I'll quote two judgments of his. Notably, Ryan Rosa, that is very important judgment, pre Bachan Singh, in which a three judge bench comprising of Justice Krishna Ayer, Justice D.A. Desai, and Justice A.P. Saint. Most of you must be knowing Ryan Rosa's fact. A murder convict was serving life sentence, was released on Gandhi Jayanti Day as an internal amnesty. He came out and in broad daylight he killed an innocent person who was trying to save his victim. Ryan the person wanted to kill that person who testified against him. That person escaped. An innocent passerby or a neighbor who wanted to save Ryan the person's potential victim, he was killed in broad daylight. And then the question came whether Ryan the person deserves death now. But these two judges, Krishna Iyer and D.A. Desai, they took a position that he is already a vegetable and there is no point in hanging a vegetable. And if he has failed to show any reforms, our prison system has failed. And therefore, death penalty is not answered. Vis-a-vis -vis that, Justice A.P. Singh gave a very hard-hitting reasoning why this man should be hanged. Anyway, my point in telling you is that discretion is driven by ideology. Now, is it time to do away with ROR? My question to panelists is, is it time to do away with ROR? And in this respect, I'll quote uh, Justice Madan Lok, who recently retired. In his 2012 judgment in Sangeet versus Haryana, saying that the just death penalty has become judge centric and it's time to go away with ROI. So I think we should apply our mind as long as the death penalty remains on the statute book. Should we do away with ROI and develop a new criteria? Second part of the question was about ROR was post Bachan saying all the murder cases were grouped under one umbrella principle ROI. Now with the new capital offenses being criminalized, notably second conviction as in Shakti Mills compound case, where death hasn't occurred, death of the victim hasn't occurred. And secondly, Poksa amendments where the victim is below 12, a girl child below 12, death penalty is one of the alternative punishments. Now my question is, when the death hasn't occurred of the victim in these two situations, Will ROR kick in when the judge decides the death penalty? Or is it an attempt by the legislators to take these offenses out of the application of ROR? And the special reasons requirement under 354.3 to be satisfied. Is it 
that the age of the victim itself is the special reason and we don't have to consider as our own. In 2012, there were no, uh, if I'm right, there were no executions. So what, apart from the latest environment of heightened uh, emotional response to sexual violence and possibly more terrorist attacks, was there anything peculiar in this phase we can say why there were no executions and what is it that we can kind of learn from that? There's much greater purchase for the administration argument uh, and fairness argument. Uh, so in that sense, sure, I mean, uh, abolitionists would believe in the ethical wrongness and, and should, I assume, uh, <coughs> but in implementing how you go about it, uh, I think there's far greater appeal to the uh, administration argument, right? And yes, it leads to the question that you rightly identified. <coughs> then I'm just saying that if we reform it sufficiently, then will you give the death penalty? Right? That's a question yes. that will arise, right? So you're saying that you're not opposed to the death penalty, it's just that we must keep reforming it. But what the underlying assumption of the strategy is that uh, the system will never get there. Right? And, 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 and that kind of torture, legal aid, requires such fundamental refixing of our system that we never get there. Right? Um, so yes, you're, you're absolutely right to identify and question that difference. Uh, and, and yeah, it is, it is, uh, you're absolutely spot on on that. Uh, right? On proportionality, you said, is the death penalty per se uh, disproportionate? And that goes back to your question, sir, that of uh, what about, what do we make of death penalty for non-homicide offenses? Um, uh, it's, it's an interesting perspective you have that, uh, I, yeah, I mean, something for me to, I hadn't really thought about it that way, that um, is, is introducing death penalty for non-homicide offenses and sexual offenses a strategy to do away with uh, rarest of the rare? I can, I can see uh, an, an ASG or the AG running that argument in court. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's something certainly to watch out for. Uh, but I, I, I think the court won't, given the manner in which Pachin Singh is drafted uh, and, and, is, and is written, yeah, since it's seen as a fundamental requirement of Article 21 <coughs> for the constitutionality of the death penalty, for the, for the death penalty to remain constitutional, they're saying you have to follow this framework. I, yeah, but yes, uh, absolutely on point in terms of, uh, I can see that argument developing. But I think it's, but the court's proportionality discourse uh, is very weak. Right. If you look at the 364A judgment, uh, that is Justice Thakur, I think, uh, where 364A of the IPC is death for kidnapping for a ransom, which is again a non-homicide offense, uh, upheld the constitutionality on very, very flimsy reasoning, saying that, you know, this is, and it, that was not a terrorism case, but the justification basically is that if we, we need to have this provision because... Uh, uh, terrorists will abduct people and keep them and their home is given. So the proportionality doctrine is not where like the American uh, Supreme Court is and you might want to read those decisions where the American Supreme Court has clearly said that you cannot give death penalty for child rape or adult rape <coughs> without loss of life because that would violate uh, the Eighth Amendment. Right? Uh, it, it, so it, it would be uh, their proportionality is that unless you cause loss of life you cannot take life. But our proportionality discourse is, in the Supreme Court is not at that heightened level, right? It's much lower, right? So you might, um, yeah. Machi Singh, I think, is is wrong in law, right? Machi Singh uh, is something that requires urgent reconsideration. Machi Singh, if you look at trial court judgments, Machi Singh is used a lot more than uh, Bachchan Singh. Right? And, and, and is something that is an urgent need for reconsideration. It might be one of the smaller challenges that are brought in into the lead up to uh, the bigger constitutional challenge. Um, and, and certainly that uh, required. Uh, uh, in terms of Ms. Modi's question on uh, prejudice, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm politically with you in, on that. Uh, but, but in terms of academic legal research, I don't think we've done the kind of work that is required to make that argument in a rigorous fashion, right? Yes, there is something there to explore, absolutely. Politically, in terms of what's dynamics, there is. But have we developed the academic 
framework to analyze that, to, to establish that claim, uh, I don't think we have. And I, and I think increasingly this trend to uh, attribute motive to judges in judgments, I don't think we should do it too easily. Right? I don't think uh, we should do it too easily because it could cut both ways. Right? It could cut both ways in the sense that uh, if we start attributing motives to individual judges, uh, and you saw that in, in a host of judgments last year, uh, I think while we can make the diversity and inclusion argument at the level of the institution, right, as, as of, of the court and the judiciary, certainly there, that, that discourse is necessary at the level of the institution. I'm not too sure in what terms that must translate into individual judgments, saying that a certain judge has written a certain way because of caste prejudice. To make that causality, to make that causal link, I think, as I said, I don't think we've developed the analytical framework to get into that. Yeah. There is not enough data to do that. Anecdotally, we, as we said, we, it is there, but uh, very difficult to uh, find particular reasons for any judges to listen. Regarding Ananya's question, another aspect would be that it's very difficult to, as an argument in court to tell the judge that, you know, this is morally and ethically wrong. The judge says, so what, this thing? Because we present this morally and ethically wrong many times and probably every day. Like, to just give a very short, uh, small example, there was a Supreme Court order saying that Anand Tiltumde should not be arrested till 11th August. He gets arrested on 1st August, uh, for, sorry, 1st February. Now, this is completely wrong, violation of the law, violation of the Supreme Court order. But the court didn't do anything. Okay, they released him. But they should have taken action. And that is where the whole problem comes, where you, though, as we believe everybody that morally and ethically wrong, there needs to be more than that to say. Because these days, morally and ethically wrong doesn't work with the judiciary. So <laughs> if you have to work for an abolitionist movement within, for, through the judiciary, there has to be much more than that. Regarding uh, Dr. Pitre's question, why there was a complete silence between 2004 to 2014, uh, there could be various reasons. I don't know. One of the reasons was probably there were no bloodthirsty precedents. So, because they kept sitting on the mercy petitions and these cases never came up. Yeah. And moment Pranab Mukherjee became the president, he started deciding the uh, mercy petitions like uh, like anything. So I don't know where, and there was whether there was any application of mine because the time frame in which these mercy petitions were decided, even for that matter of uh, Kasab and Afzal, I think, was um, and the time taken in the other mercy petitions with, which needs to be uh, looked into. So I think there was somewhere a political uh, this thing about death penalty with certain coalition governments being there. And this, as we see with the robust majority, robust nationalism playing on and which is playing out with death penalty also. I think.